I said, empty your mind. Be formless, shapeless, like water. Now you put water into a cup, it becomes the cup. You put water into a bottle, it becomes the bottle. You put it in a teapot, it becomes the teapot. Be water, my friend. Hey guys, welcome to another episode of the Flow Great Show. I'm super excited because today I have UK's leading biohacker and my good friend Tim Gray here. And we're going to talk travel biohacking. So you'll find out which biohacks you can use in order to travel more healthily, to feel better, to have more energy when you're on a plane, in a train, in a hotel room, spending a lot of nights, maybe in other time zones in different countries in different places so first of all welcome tim thank you for being on the show finally we talked a long time about that there we have thanks for having me mate <laughs> so you prepared already a little something so we're going to dig into that but before we start talking about travel biohacks and uh, also uh, the summit where people can actually then apply everything they learn in this show and come to london and uh, be with us in may we want to dig into the field of biohacking a little bit. And my first question for you is because your label nowadays is, and I hear that all the time, the Times writes about you as the UK leading biohacker. In your words nowadays, what does it mean to be a biohacker? It means to measure various things that you do for you to improve your health, opposed to just guessing. And that means thinking traditional routes and less traditional routes. It's about what works and measuring to see how you improve. It's very, very simple. So you'd say the measuring part is, is essential because I always have uh, trouble explaining that to people. What is the difference, for example, between a yogi or someone interested in their health doing uh, all kinds of different fitness regimens, diets, and so on, than in comparison to a biohacker. But I also would say that um, because it became so cheap to look into your body using tools, using diagnostics, mm -hmm. using DNA tests. That is what differentiates the biohacker is that he uses these tools in order to understand himself better with, with object, objective feedback. Yeah, completely, completely. For instance, I'll give you a quick example. One that's relevant for the moment is um, instead of waking up with a headache or feeling sluggish every morning and saying, I wonder if it's, you know, something in my bedroom. Or how about measuring what's going on in the bedroom? For instance, I carry this around with me everywhere nowadays, mm. which is uh, the Altos. Um, For all the listeners, which uh, Tim is showing here, is a little white device which measures the quality of air. It, 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 just, it looks very simple. but Yeah, it, ca it measures uh, carbon dioxide and oxygen levels. It also measures humidity, sound level, and um, uh, room temperature. And basically... I've been carrying it around with me for quite some time now because air quality is important because I live in central London and I have an air doctor to purify or clean the air. Um, but really, I was noticing that some days I'd wake up with a headache and some days I wouldn't. And it directly correlates with how little oxygen or how much carbon dioxide is in the room. Um, so I carry this with me everywhere. For instance, I measured it in a clinic in central London the other day and it was, you know, serious fatigue levels of... Uh, carbon dioxide in the room and this is a clinic where it's supposed to be for health so instead of just guessing and saying oh, i wonder what it might be it's actually looking and seeing specifically so that you can optimize it so for instance for me now i know that i have to sleep with my window open in the bedroom and thus combating the morning fatigue so that's essentially what biohacking is and it's the reason why it's become so popular so very quickly is because it's diagnostic you know, doctors do blood tests for a reason it's to see so we can refine you know you sure you can optimize 80 percent of the way subjectively a lot of the time you know by mm. removing the things that are basically obvious but some things are less obvious and until you measure them you just don't see that's uh, exactly what i try to tell people when they ask me and also think about hey isn't that narcissistic when you measure things about yourself and look at your own health and always compare it to yeah, a professional athlete where it's completely normal to track statistics and people get super excited about it and then how many points did he score, rebounds did he have. Uh, and uh, on the other side, a financial guru, like when you deal with with finances as a resource, it's completely normal to track it, to be responsible mm -hmm. and to look at the markers 
and see if you're successful or not and responsible with that resource of finance. But when it comes to health, people see it, uh, it, it is a resource, but oftentimes I, I feel like they don't see it as a resource that needs to be tracked, but it, it's, it's subjective, it's somehow ephemeral. Um, and uh, it's changing right now through our scene as well. I see that. And I want to lead to a, a coin that you, uh, a term that you coined, which is health optimization. And my question for you is because you went from from biohacking sort of to using health optimization as a, as a replacement. But my question for you is, how has your definition of biohacking leading to that new term, health optimization, changed when you first came in contact with the term biohacking? That's a very good question. Um, I just want to touch on something first before I answer that is we're told to put our own oxygen mask on first in the event of a, an issue in the plane. That's for a reason. Should we not put our own oxygen mask on by measuring and adjusting? And you don't need to go too far down the rabbit hole, but you know, basic things. We should put our own oxygen mask on first. So if people say that's narcissistic, that's really interesting because it's basically saying that they won't put their oxygen mask on first, which means they can't help others. And that is even more self-centered, in mm. my opinion. So this is just a bit of a uh, contradiction. In terms of Interesting uh, uh, example. Thank you. Um, and then in terms of how it's evolved, I think biohacking can be very narcissistic and there's quite a few people in the space that actually are and because they're self-obsessed. I, I completely agree. I can see that. I think the difference between biohacking and health optimization specifically is <clears throat> health optimization. The, the goal is in the name. It's just clear cut. There's no ambiguity, none. Everything within health optimization is to optimize or promote health. Biohacking, however, can be the most expensive gadgets. It can be to measure your brain waves, not necessarily to optimize. It can be um, supplements that might work. Who knows? The goal isn't necessarily better health. It can be better performance, which obviously they go hand in hand, better performance with better health. But like if you look at the bodybuilding industry, for instance, they are their performance optimization. Many of them are unhealthy on the inside and unhappy. You just have to look at Ben Pakulski, world famous bodybuilder. He came out openly saying how unhappy he was from caring about the aesthetic side of things and how unhealthy he was as a reason and became a biohacker. He was speaking at the first Health Optimization Summit as a great podcast, by the way, for anyone who wants to check him out, Ben Pakulski. Yes, and um, <clears throat> so I think health optimization, it's stated, not implied. Biohacking is implying, not stating. And, um, you know, there's quite a few brands in the biohacking space that don't necessarily promote health. Um, and I, I think in a, in, in a tangent to that is if you look at the ketogenic movement, let's call it, ketogenic diet for some people, many people, is very good for health. But it's a ketogenic diet. And when you go around a keto, ketogenic conference, for instance, the brands will be keto cookies, which keep you in keto, in the ketosis state. But eating processed chemical cookies that keep you in a ketogenic state isn't healthy. And yet people often are in the ketogenic state for health, but not always. It's implied, not stated. So it's the same with biohacking. And it's the same with a lot of these diets or movements not necessarily health first which is for me my goal i'm in it because i was ill and uh, still continue with some health things as you know but the point is is i've gone from 60 percent sick to five percent and i'm always trying to optimize that five percent to be the best version of myself for health optimization not just to be the smartest person or the richest person or any of these things which you know obviously health attracts money <clears throat> but by being healthy <clears throat> excuse me, by being healthy, you can actually perform better, um, more optimally and more efficiently. Be in flow more. Exactly. <laughs> so so for me, that's what health optimization is. Yeah, it's wonderful. And I, I, what I love about it is that it's yeah, this toolkit where everyone can find something to improve something about himself, about the life uh, of himself and his surroundings and others and his family. And uh, by the way, we're going to do a little advertisement here right now because we're going to talk a little bit more about it at the end of the episode. But right now, there's the Health Optimization Summit. You're the founder of it. It's happening 
very soon right now if you're listening to this episode either in april or in may 2022 then you are lucky because you still have the chance to be part of the health optimization summit and uh, when does it take place and where i let you answer that may 28th and 29th in london central london and there is around 2000 to 2200 biohackers or health optimizers 35 speakers and 105 brands personally selected every single brand they're all promoting health um, there's some expensive gadgets there's some very cool supplements and there's some very natural things and it's a mix of all of that so it's a it's a playground if health is important to you um, and I can only say from my experience, I was part of the first summit. It was an amazing experience. There were workshops. There were very interesting people from all over the world. Uh, I was a participant then, but now I'm a speaker this year. I'm actually talking about the flow state and the current research on flow and how it connects to happiness and productivity and many other things. It's a wonderful state of consciousness. I'm very excited to be part of the summit. And uh, I have a short link for you. If you want to get your ticket, we have a deal for you and it's flowgrade.de slash HOS. It, it will link to the website, to uh, our uh, partner link for the summit and you can then get your ticket, come to London and then use the travel hacks we are about to tell you today. Now, I repeat again, it's flowgrade.de slash HOS, H-O-S, like Health Optimization Summit. Very easy, and it will lead you to the website where you can get your tickets. All right, back to the episode. I actually have a couple more questions before we dig into travel biohacking. One is, Tim, you've really had contact with a, a bunch of very interesting people, many of uh, them who I've also worked with or I admire and uh, I'm about excited to meet, hopefully at the summit, uh, including Dave Asprey, the father of biohacking, Ben Greenfield, Vishen Lakiani, Amy Killen, Max Gansler and Andreas Breitfeld. But you had so many different characters that you were in touch with. Um, can you talk a little bit about the different approaches that you have encountered and what you have learned from them and maybe incorporated into your personal individual style and approach? Um, hmm. I know that's a tough one. I, uh, I'm, I like to learn from everyone and everything. And often it can be something that I admire or some work from someone or something I don't admire and I do the opposite. Um, so everyone's a mentor in some regards. And for me, the patterns that I kept on seeing was that most of the biohacking space was mimicking nature. And it's a line I often say very frequently. I feel disingenuous by saying it again. But the point is, is everything that we're doing is using technology to reverse the damage that's caused by technology. So mimicking a natural environment in an unnatural world. Um, for instance, blue blocking glasses, mm. block out blue light, which is fake at the wrong time of day anyway. Um, um, blackout blinds, nighttime, hyperbaric oxygen therapy, replacing clean, good air. Um, every single one of these things, even PMF devices or, you know, mineral supplements, it's all mimicking nature in some way. Cryotherapy, you know, from when we used to bath in a stream or in a lake, you know, it's, it's um, triggering many different processes, including hormesis in our bodies. All of these things, that's the similarities. So I learned from everyone. I'm, I would consider myself a cura curator and just learn from everyone around me the best I can. And often I find things that I had read in some books to be completely wrong years later. For instance, once upon a time I was told the ketogenic diet was the best thing ever. I tried it. We then find out there's something called dirty keto, which is, you know, not necessarily healthy. And it's just getting into ketosis. So <clears throat> it's constantly evolving like science is. Um, so really the, the similarities I've seen across the whole board is that most of these things mimic nature in, somehow, in, some, re in some way, even stem cell therapy is mm -hmm. mimicking nature and we, oh, mm -hmm. yeah, and we can't get away from that so so really you know um dr sachin panda's work who's the speaker um this year at the summit um is around circadian rhythms mm -hmm. and he wrote this famous book called circadian rhythms yes uh, circadian code yeah uh, the circadian code and um you know how he realized that when he was on a tent in the middle of a field and there was no unnatural light actually his circadian rhythm significantly better and all the studies that he did with rodents around that 
um, and timing of food and the timing of your day and how that sets you up for a good night's sleep. So that's one, for instance, um, again, mimicking nature. Um, we've got Dr. Harry Adelson, who's known for the full body stem cell therapy and stem cells, obviously harvesting stem cells, which tells the body to regenerate in many different ways, multiple different ways, more than we know still. Um, and again, that's mimicking nature. And so that's what I've learned from there. Um, wow, just so many different speakers. I mean, Ben obviously being the ultimate biohacker, I would say, in terms of performance. Um, slightly different to Dave Asprey's approach, which was, you know, sick and unhealthy, overweight business guy and needed to optimize his mind. Um, whereas Ben Greenfield is an ultra athlete who wants to be, you know, have that 1% better all the time. Um, so really, I, I, you know, I take the best from each of them and um, they're just heuristics. All, these, all of these guys and all this work is just heuristics to say, will this work for me on an on a, you know, a individual basis? Do you see anything between all those guys, this question just came to me, that they have in common? Ben, Dave, Vision, Sachin, you maybe. Uh, is there like one attribute, one characteristic that, that sticks out to you? I would say I wouldn't necessarily include Sachin Panda in this one. Yeah, he's a scientist and a researcher, whereas um, I would say myself, Dave, Ben, Temu, um, and all these guys are definitely all in or nothing types and i and i see you know the same jack cruz yeah, jack Cru <laughs> yeah um all in or nothing and you know i do think that there's a process of growing and i think eventually we start opening up and realizing that what we think is right isn't necessarily always right and i think there's a tendency of people having you know um thinking that other people are wrong quite a lot of the time but i think we all we all grow and i think it's an, a, an evolution of many of the key biohackers mm. in, in, a, in and um, so I'd say the common trait is all in or nothing types and we'll go for their goal, whatever happens. Um, and I, what I see also, I thought about myself, how I would answer that question. First of all, I think it's curiosity as well for, for the world. And I would include Sachin in that actually, mm -hmm. but also, especially the names you mentioned is the ability to weather a storm. I, I see that a lot. Like there are a lot of people that I think could not go out and say something, maybe controversial, maybe uh, something that they would get thrown off Instagram mm. for some time or uh, that a lot of people would argue with and then kind of stand your ground. I think you have to have uh, like this personality that can take a hit. Mm. And I see that in you. I see that uh, and you're very reflective. Uh, and I really appreciate that actually about you because you think about the criticism that that people bring to you and then you think about it and you we had this discussion sometimes tim and i have almost brotherly fights <laughs> about certain topics and it's it's interesting because every time then we see each other again you've thought about the the topic of discussion and says say you know um i have a different angle now and and i think this ability to to weather a storm some people are maybe a bit more um, um defensive but they still stand their ground but that is also something i see one more question regarding this because um, now i recommend everyone if you want to find out more about tim's story you find it on his amazing instagram very dynamic you share a lot of things uh, you have multiple podcast episodes so i don't want to really get go into all your story we don't have the time for that but Good. you <laughs> you scratched your own itch um and you used biohacking and different methods that are out there to solve your own health issues and uh, there are actually a couple of posts i recommend to look really at uh, at tim gray at tim biohacker which is his instagram tag uh, uk's leading biohacker and you will find a photo where there are three u's how you changed over the years and actually you look you look a lot younger and fitter and uh, healthier now than you looked 10 years ago mm. and uh, the one question before we go into travel biohacking don't go away is is there one experience uh, or one attitude something that sticks out that was really important for you to solve the problem and i'm talking about more uh, uh, um, maybe an openness to subjects you didn't believe would work certain diagnostic tools uh, is there something that you remember was a, a turning point and where you said this is actually working for me mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, there is. 
<clears throat> and my mind went straight there. Um, so I trust that it was actually when um, my friend Matt Maruka from Raw Optics told me about grounding. And um, he was like, it's amazing. It gives you energy, blah, 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 blah. And I'm like, my God, dude, this is so woo woo. It's just rubbish. And he's like, dude, you've got to try it. And um, we're in we're in LA at the time, traveling together, me, him and Dasha, um, early 2019. And he was standing in the sea, first thing in the morning, seeing sunrise. And him and Dasha were standing in the sea, looking out. And I looked down at them from the balcony while I was doing my Instagram or something or other, thinking they're bonkers. And uh, when he came back up and I said, okay, so tell me a little bit more. And he told me about it. Anyway, so I started reading into it. And actually, I mentioned this yesterday about a different about a different topic, but this is my approach. I downloaded every podcast I could find around grounding. I looked at every resource I could. I spent probably four to six weeks somewhere around there just reading everything I could. I didn't have any other focus at all, really trying to understand and looking at the studies and then testing it on myself. And I didn't talk about grounding once until I was in a place of knowledge. And I went from thinking it's woo-woo and BS to it's a hidden mystery. It's like one of the best things for health you can do. And that was a 180 flip, 180 flip. And so now often I approach things, I approach things where I could be wrong. And this actually comes to the point with, you know, conflicts or, you know, even, you know, with our, you and I, things that we work through or other relationships and things for me. If you can have one opinion and I can have another opinion and they're completely opposite. If I had been where you had been and you had been where I had been and we had heard the opposite information that made us form that opinion, could we not have the opposite opinion just because we're in a different place at a different time? And I'm like, when you think like that, for instance, it might have been a magazine you read five years ago and you don't know where that information comes from. It's like, what actually got you to form that opinion? And now I'm like this with most things. Like I literally drill into it, like, where did I first hear that? Can I validate where I first heard that? And what am I forming my opinion on? It's interesting. It, it, it relates to something I've heard recently on the Tim Ferriss show, actually, with uh, Morgan Housel, the psychology of money, who said that an opinion needs to be able to be challenged. Mm. So you need to have uh, the ability to challenge your opinion with another opinion. Mm. Otherwise, it's not an opinion. Mm. Uh, it's it's simple. Like, for example, you can say that, um, yeah, grounding works. And then there needs to be also an opinion that grounding does not work. Mm. And then you can go into the specifics or the context or the situations where it might not work and might work. And I thought that was, I think it goes a little bit into what you're saying. Mm. Yeah, so I take that approach with everything you know everything even the controversial topics you know recent in the recent years and i look at it from both perspectives i could be wrong i could be right but then actually based on a book i talk about very frequently which is uh, thinking in bets by annie duke and uh by the way we'll link to everything and it's flowgrade.de slash folge and then the number of the episode usually but i'll create a short link which is flowgrade.de slash tim gray and we'll link to all the recommendations also the products we'll show later and the book recommendation and can you repeat the book one more time yeah thinking in bets by annie duke and um basically how a poker player world-class poker player thinks and how um, you work out the best route to go from and it's about working out the odds and I'll give you a very very quick example because this is a game changer for me if you have a hand of cards that has an 80% chance of winning you play that hand okay if you play it a thousand times you will win 800 out of a thousand okay but if you lose five times in a row most people will adjust that hand in real in real world setting I'm not talking in poker you're like, oh, I've lost five times in a row. Okay, I'm going to change. But if you carried on, you would actually win 800 times out of 1,000. Now, so that's one point, okay? So think about the odds of things, always. Mm -hmm. So with decisions like this, I'm like, for instance, um, grounding, for instance, let's go with that. Grounding versus not grounding. What are the odds that it works based on all the research I've done? Pretty high. What are the odds that it could actually hurt me pretty low are incorporated. So with each, for instance, when I'm running the conference in year one, 2019, it was very, very hard. I mean, it was 
thousand moving parts, you know, very, very stressful. And many decisions coming up that were very tough. And um, all I did was looked at all the options and assigned a percentage chance of it winning and eradicated the ones that weren't based on this book. And it's the same with the biohacks I choose risk to reward ratio. It's all calculated, all of it. Um, and that's what helps you win quicker. And this is subjective data to help you optimize the same as biohacking, it's just a systems thinking approach. Uh, Tim, this is something I really value also about our discussions because I am very different and much more intuitive and subjective. And I really value that because what Tim does actually with health optimization, he also can do with other aspects in his life. He is a natural optimizer. So whenever it comes to, to things, I've seen that kind of thinking with you, even when, when I ask you a question regarding my business, for example, and then you take it apart and you, you think in this way. And now I just realized that you, some, you think in, in odds mm -hmm. and what makes most sense to you. And it's super valuable. So um, again, something I really appreciate about you and our friendship. Let's switch gears and go finally into what we promised in the beginning, which is travel biohacking. And before we go into things that could help people travel healthier and uh, just avoid some of those downfalls, let's focus on exactly the risks and the challenges of traveling. So in your, um, from your experience, but also maybe objectively looking at someone who is traveling to a different place it doesn't have to be another time zone now but what are the associated risks or challenges on someone's health when they go and get into the car get on the train uh climb a plane and fly somewhere go somewhere good question i think what you should do is take it back a step and say what are the basic things that we need to operate that's where it begins All right. Everything else is just noise and BS. So if we talk about, and I talk about the fundamentals of health, what our body needs to operate as it should do. Many people don't have these things in place. So if we think about the first one, which is sleep, have you slept properly before traveling? And is your body in a stress state? Meaning that you probably get sick when you travel. And so many people get a cold when they're on the plane, one, because of the air being circulated, recirculated, but two, because they probably got up at 5 a.m. in the morning or haven't slept properly the night before because they're worried they're not going to wake up with the alarm clock, which I do sometimes, which is why I don't book, book flights before midday generally. Yeah, same here. Um, and so you put things in place to make sure that you don't have these um, issues. You know, if the cake is on the table, 90% of the time people will pick up the cake on the table. So you make sure that the cake isn't on the table. And it's the same with your flight times and things. Um, so first of all, it's sleep. Make sure that your sleep is good. If you're traveling in time zones, then obviously... You need to make sure that your body is prepared for the time zone shift. And that means you can adjust it or start adjusting it a few days before. You know, go to bed a couple of hours earlier and take some melatonin or wear your blue blocking glasses a little bit earlier, which is the better one. Um, and wake up earlier, or depending on the time zone. So that's number one. Make sure that you're seeing sunrise. Make sure that you're resetting your circadian rhythm when you arrive and grounding in the new time zone that you're in. Um, so, so think about your sleep and what you need to do to make sure that you have quality sleep and that you're repaired because obviously sleeping is reversing the damage that we've done to our body during the day. So if you don't sleep properly, you're not reversing the damage and getting away quicker, which is why it's the longevity tool number one. Mm -hmm. And so many people expect a pill or all these things to help with their longevity, but in fact, they're not even sleeping properly and they're not even wearing blue blocking glasses or there's something wrong with their sleep, which is the biggest indicator that they need to act on something. And everything else follows from that. So number one is the sleep. Number two, what does our body need? It's water and minerals for our electrical system and detoxification. And without the right hydration and without uh, the balance of minerals, your electrical system isn't going to be work working properly. You're going to be fatigued. You're going to get brain fog. You're going to stress your body, which means you're not going to sleep properly. So number one gets affected. So if I just look at those two things for a second, What else can we do to optimize our sleep and our minerals and water while we're traveling? Make sure you're getting quality water all the time. Make sure you're hydrating enough and make sure you take a mineral supplement or Celtic sea salt, which is 78 to 82 trace elements and minerals in one thing, which you can buy anywhere in any country around the world. So you don't need to worry about that. 
by the way, uh, when you are with Tim, he always has some Celtic seal salt with him and he puts it pretty much in anything. Mm -hmm. I think I've even seen you drop it in coffee and I tried that. For me, it, it's a no-go. <laughs> but you put too much. You probably put too much. Um, I mean, you need to do a sprinkle. It actually really makes it different um, really nicely. But anyway, so the point is, is hydration is important. I mean, I carry... Celtic sea salt with me or this stuff, uh, Totem Sport, actually. So this is actually um, filtered seawater that has uh, plankton in and it has uh, 78 to 82 trace elements and minerals in it as well. You, you put it straight into yep, your mouth? Yeah, so yeah, tear it open and, mm -hmm. and drink. So these are great. And in fact, I was on a flight to LA a few years ago, pre-lockdowns pre, uh, and stuff, and there was a kid on the plane in front of me and the mum, his mum was massaging his head and he was, you know, you could see he was in such pain and she was like massaging his poor kid's head. And I just stuck my head around and said, have one of these and, uh, and like got a bottle of water. 20 minutes later, he was fine. Planes are so dehydrating. It's very dry air and um, our body goes through in a massive amount of stress through it. And he was just dehydrated and he was fine. And this is, you know, that's why it's supplement, supplement number one. Um, so really, and then with, with, you know, other things such as, so we've got sleep, we've got mineralization and water, hydration, mm -hmm. which sort of supports, you know, lots of our body. It's clean air. So as, as I showed earlier on is my Altos device to making sure I have clean air. And on planes, it's horrendous, like literally one out of 10 air quality except for if you're on Norwegian Airlines. We, we, you showed us your device before that measured it, like out of 10, because we, we uh, right now measured it here, and we are in the Bavarian mountains, and it was nine out of 10, and yeah. probably 10 is quite hard to, to get without yeah. artificial help. But what number was it on the plane? Do you remember? Yeah, one. One out of 10. Some of the time it's two, but one. But there's a caveat to this. There's a technology, I think, that Boeing make, that Norwegian Air, which is the newest fleet of planes or was um, a few years ago, have clean air technology, which actually bring air from the outside of the cabin into the plane constantly. And it's really interesting. So I was discussing with the air hostess at the time about how it is working with clean air technology. And she said, none of the staff get jet lag or hangovers from the flight, so much flying mm. in the new fleet because the air quality is so different. And this app actually is Get Outos. Actually, I reached out to them because I, I heard it was such a good device and I'm, I'm not an affiliate. I'm not, I, I did invite them to the summit because I thought it's so bloody brilliant and I promote them for free. What's the, what's the name? Altos, A-L-T-O-S. Um, because I think it's just such a game changing device for making you realize like if you're slumping at your desk in the afternoon and you've got brain fog or you're not feeling good or you've got a bit of a headache, it can alert you when that's happening. And that's productivity 101 to get you into flow state or make you feel better. And on a plane, it's so bad, which is why when you're out, you should really do some breath work and some grounding immediately. The grounding, which is the next point, grounding in nature, gives you free electrons. And those free electrons basically find free radicals, which are by, by, by product of energy um, um, production. It's almost neutralizes it and reduces inflammation and helps the body heal. So that's a very simplified, very simplified form of what grounding does. But just a quick side note, because the, the products, you don't have to write everything down. You find them on the show notes. Just a repeat again, flowgrade.de slash Tim Gray. Mm -hmm. One word, and then we'll link to all of those products that we recommend and show us right now, because mm -hmm. there's a bunch more. And I know a lot of people are saying, what did he say? What was the brand? So we'll just take yeah. care of that. So, so really, when, you, when it comes to traveling, everything should really fit within that. So you should understand that you need to get grounding, you need to see, sleep properly, you need to hydrate properly, and you need to have the right minerals. And all of those things are pretty easy, you know, with the exception of grounding in a city, um, if there's no natural grass um, around. Really, um, stretching and movement, breath work, meditation, all these things are very easy to do and free. And the biohacking that I generally talk about is free. You don't need to buy any of these products. You don't, you really don't. But they do help you refine. 80% you can do without, the 20% is the refinement. Just like the, um, um, the cycling team that actually had the 1% optimization on multiple different things. You know, you need to measure these things to improve. And I forget which book it comes from. I think it's, um, I think it was from Bounce the book Bounce. Um, 
Mm -hmm. if you um syed i'm forgetting his first name um yeah i remember syed, i think it is um anyway, yes yes um and and how one percent improvements can mean that massive wins can happen by compound effect the, the author of black box i think as well i think i read his book black um, box yeah, I read that one. but basically the 80 percent you can do with all this stuff without any products at all any the 20 percent the further refinements can be done with these things and that's really where i look these days to get um yeah so okay so we uh, just to repeat so we have sleep we have hydration yep. you mentioned a couple others breathing uh movement mm -hmm. mineralization in, in combination with hydration yep. but now when you actually start traveling like what are the basics that you that you prepare uh, for for your journey for my journey uh, that's a great question i take the bare minimum with me the absolute bare minimum bearing in mind that i live in central london you know zone two so not central central but the air quality isn't great but it's it's okay um i need grounding products such as a grounding bed sheet a grounding mouse mat standing desk all of these things that nature would provide so half of the things that i have at home i don't need when i'm traveling because when i travel i generally get out of a city mm. maybe spend a day in munich or dusseldorf or whatever but i'm generally attracted to sun and grass and work on my laptop in the garden and sea water yeah yeah for sure <laughs> um so most of the things i don't need most of them um and then when i'm back in city i'm using technology to reverse technology so that's really it. but the things that i do take with me that are non-negotiable and i'll show you some of them i'll run through some of them. Mm -hmm. so obviously air quality monitor the altos yeah i bloody love this thing it is really it's cool. really cool actually it has a really intuitive app and you just see the air quality and it's super interesting when you have it close to your mouth you mm -hmm. see change down because obviously there's less oxygen yeah, and more so, co2 so that's that's one the other one is um actually the face mask now Face That's masks, a really cool one, yeah. They're nothing new, let's be honest. They're not. But the devil is in the detail. Mm -hmm. For instance, cars are nothing new, but they keep on coming out with better versions, more refined, that are better for the world, you know, for, for getting around. Or, you know, the iPhone, while it's not groundbreaking every time a new one comes out, it's tiny little refinements. You go, That's awesome. You know? It's the same with the the sleep mask, and this is from guys called Z Lab. They reached out to me and said, Tim, just try this, please. It's different. I was like, yeah, yeah, yeah. I get sent so many products. I really don't need more products. You know, I turn stuff away these days. They said, please just try it. Like you talk about sleep, try it. So I was like, okay, fine, sure, whatever. It's a face mask, but it's got really soft edging around it and space for your eyes. So you can actually open your eyes and blink your eyes without it rubbing inside so it feels like you don't have anything on your face and then around the nose it has this very soft area so you don't get any light in it at all and it's got a really good eye strap so it's the best one i've ever tried and i use them a lot i prefer to use blackout blinds generally but sometimes that can mess with your um, circadian rhythm this just stops you from waking up so easily and so mm -hmm. i carry one with these wherever i go for instance the bedrooms here are very light in the morning and while i like to get up early it's still better to not wake up at five o'clock when you've gone to bed at you know 11 30. so True. so this is this is a non-negotiable for me and i take them everywhere you know if, if what's it called z lab uh, z lab sleep mask. is it a british company or yes it is actually um and they're going to be at the conference um in another reason to come to london guys yeah. But in fact, get I, a new sleep mask. I begged them to come in the end. I was like, you've got to be there. Like, it's, it's funny how they went from trying to convince me to try one for me to convince them to come to the conference. So for now, we have the Altos air quality measurement device. We have the sleep mask, Z Lab. We have what you showed us before, Totem Sport, which is a mineralization agent uh, combined with salt to keep you hydrated. Next thing blue blocking glasses obviously now it's a biohacker staple and i always say and except for if i'm on a desert island if there's any unnatural light this is the biohack that i will never ever give up it's my non-negotiable over everything okay what tim is carrying right now or holding in his hand is a, a pair of glasses 
which have orange or red tinted glasses inside and uh, for the ones who have maybe not been following the biohacking scene you see them uh, at biohacking events uh, all the time people wear them inside usually and andreas breitfeld our co uh, mutual friend always calls them the number one contraceptive for biohackers because yeah. it's just it, it's becoming more sexy and actually uh the, the ones you, you're you're wearing right now or mm. holding here uh they are I think not bad for me. They're a bit too small. Tiny on you. You're a, you're a big guy. Yeah. But remember the first the first pairs who came out. I mean, I mean they look kind of like a bit clunky, uh, not so sexy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, the, so the, the the very basic science behind them is blue light stops us secreting melatonin, our sleep hormone, and um, fake light is predominantly blue, and we wouldn't see blue light after sunset except for a tiny little bit in fire. Um, and so our ancestors wouldn't have evolved with blue light after sunset, which means that we're stimulated after sunset because of the blue light, especially with our eyes, because they're very photoreceptive. Um, also light falling on our skin wakes us up as does in the eyes, but significantly mm, worse in the eyes. Yeah. Which is why a sleep mask is so good because it, it stops you waking up so sensitively, but it doesn't eradicate the issue completely. Now, blue blocking glasses after sunset, I mean, I start getting tired within two hours of wearing them. So I know two hours before bed, I put them on. That's pretty much my rule most of the time with the odd exception. Um, so I can vouch for that. Yeah. By the way, I think that I, the study I found on that already a couple of years ago um, was that people wearing the glasses for four hours a day mm -hmm. had a, up to 60% higher melatonin level, mm -hmm. which is the falling asleep hormone. Mm. Yeah, so for me, it's non-negotiable. Now, some scientists say, yeah, it's amazing and shown loads of studies on it. And other people, more mainstream medical say, no, nah, there's no there's no truth in it. But again, this comes back to biohacking. It's what works for you as an individual, because that's what matters. It doesn't matter what works for thousands of people in a study. It matters what works for you, even if it's placebo, which is the body's miraculous way of saying, I don't need anything to improve mm. which if it works for you that's what you should do and for me this works significantly and with everyone i try it with it works brilliantly in f around two percent of people i know are super light sensitive so they can't these don't work for them very well they need to be in candlelight they can't have any household lights on they can't have any light on their skin without interfering with their skin uh, their sleep mm. but these are really negotiable non-negotiable number one for me um and these are by raw optics uh, actually, the um, Matt Raruka, the guy I mentioned earlier on about grounding, mm -hmm. um, he this is his brand. Um, yeah, we have in Germany. We have. Uh, the, I think these were actually the first blue blocking glasses, if I'm right, mm. that were ever developed. They come from Germany, and uh, Alexander Wunsch, I think, was mm. one of them who uh, co-developed them with a company called Innovation Eyewear, and they actually know Matt, and he visited them and got some input. Um, but as far as I know, please correct me if you know more about that. But I think I heard that they came out already years ago with, with first of all, it was, I think, color therapy mostly. Mm -hmm. And then they noticed this, it's actually helpful in keeping your hormones um, straight, mm -hmm. considering all the blue light we have now. Yeah. I mean, again, melatonin is a hormone. Um, it's not just a sleep hormone. It's a really powerful antioxidant as well. And if your hormone, if one hormone is out of whack... What does it do to the rest of them? It does affect them. And for people that have hormone imbalances, low testosterone, high cortisol, in fact, it throws other things out. It, it does. And the funny thing is, this is where grounding plays into it as well, actually. There's actually people with low cortisol, the ground brings their cortisol to baseline. And people with high cortisol that are super stressed when you're grounding actually brings it down to baseline. It's amazing how it's like, almost like an ad adaptogenic herb you know it adapts to what you need and it ties in with hormone balancing and this, this is why grounding and light two of nature's things that we're interfering with by not grounding by walking around on concrete floors or in, in houses and using fake light we're just using technology to reverse so so that has it ties in so yeah blue blocking glasses with grounding do you have any devices that maybe are even mobile that you can take with you on on the on the plane i mean you just mentioned that you try to you know minimize anything you take but is there anything that actually works that you know of 
So uh, Jack Cruz talks about using an earthing strap to the seat mounting in a plane. Um, and apparently earthing can work even when you're in the air because the plane is earth. I would much rather just ground when I get down to earth. Mm. And in fact, uh, Andreas um, developed or worked with a company that did um, EMF shielding trousers mm. and it had actually a clip on it yes. that you could that you could use on the plane which is I have a funny story about that because I actually was attaching the clip on the plane mm. and, and the stewardess saw it and uh, the flight attendant and she was shocked she said what are you doing like th thinking I'm, I'm messing with the plane somehow and I said no 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 I'm trying to ground <laughs> attaching this wire to, to the seat in front of me um, so yeah so um yeah, I much prefer to ground when I land. And I mean, I did ca used to ca carry travel with a, a grounding earth uh, wrist strap that you can actually put around your wrist and plug into the wall in the earth element of the plug socket because houses are earthed out. But the thing is, I would have to carry a, a meter to check to see if there's dirty electricity, which is, you know, potentially has a negative effect. So really, I prefer to... Um, is this device, by the way, that you uh, recommended to me, it costs twelve dollars, I think, on Amazon, mm -hmm. uh, to measure EMF, which is quite quite effective. What what is that called? Uh, it's actually in a multimeter for checking earthing um, capabilities. So so you can hold one end and you can put the other um, on an earthing mat and check to see if it's earthed out to see if there's a flow of free electrons, basically. Um, and you can also check your body voltage. And it's funny because if you use the multimeter and check your body voltage and you get near an electric switch or near a plug or near the router, you see your body voltage go up. And then Crazy. as soon as you put your foot on an earthing mat, your body voltage will go to zero. Mm. Something even the ground probably then uh, yeah, yeah, outside. Yeah. yeah, so the ground is obviously the ultimate, but you know, when you're outside in the garden, you haven't typically got a plug socket next to your head, which is why when people sleep, in, in a hotel room or at home and their bed head is right next to the wall and you measure the body voltage, you'll see that the body voltage is super high. And this is why some people can't sleep in some rooms and like have a terrible night's sleep in a hotel room. Like for instance, when I stay in a hotel room, if there's a key card that goes in the thing to make the whole room work, I pull it out at night because mm -hmm. the whole room is shut off, except for the Wi-Fi. And if the Wi-Fi router is in the hallway, I go and unplug that as well. And then my sleep is significantly better. So m one thing you should take from this is wherever you are, pull the bed away from the wall, even at home, because if you've got plug sockets running behind your bed head, you've got electricity right next to your head and you can measure it with that multimeter. It's uh, something that actually a, a construction biologist that I had on the show mm. uh, told me that he was working with a, a woman and she was not sleeping well for 10 years and he looked at her home mm. and it was exactly the case uh, that she was sleeping, uh, like she just had super high voltage uh, on the spot where she where her bed was mm. and he just moved the bed a couple of meters and uh, after 10 years almost instantly she was sleeping better so if you have sleeping problems you might want to check your voltage while you're sleeping if you're close to a socket if there's it could also be that there is electricity running below that there is some some sort of wire so uh, keep that in mind yeah, yeah completely and most people miss this as well like, actually i did a post on instagram a couple of weeks ago it says pull your bed away from the wall 18 inches if you're not sleeping too good and turn the wi-fi route off in fact there was a consult i did with a guy i do occasional biohacking consults i try not to do too many um but people that are really struggling just just to see how their environment's set up and things and uh, he said that the whole family sleep was awful and when we went around his environment discussing it they had wi-fi router under his bed and under the kids bed a wi-fi router under the bed now ten, over 10 years ago in an apartment i lived in with a housemate at the time i would never sleep well i didn't for like six months it was insane I'm like always semi-awake always felt like i was just not quite sleeping properly Anyway, one day we had the decorators in and we moved the Wi-Fi router to the far side of the lounge wall and my, my bed backed onto the lounge wall. And overnight my sleep changed. And I wasn't a biohacker. I didn't know any of this stuff at this point. I was just like, there's something going on here, like Wi-Fi signal right like less than a foot from my head, buzzing all day, every day. And then my sleep changes. It's like, that's, that's personalized data even if there's no science confirming it which actually there's more and more happening and i recommend reading the book emfd by dr mccola um because that goes into a load of the different studies and he's done a lot of uh, exploration in that area mm. um also i think clint ober is going to be at the summit uh no he's not he, no that's uh, that's the next one he'll be at yeah yeah okay. um so um 
But basically, by moving the router, I slept better almost immediately. And that was before I knew biohacking. And so even if people say, oh, there's no science in that. Mm, yeah, but if it works for me, it works for me. And I keep on hearing the same thing. So, so really understanding your environment like this when you're in a hotel room or even at home. And you guys should go and check after this podcast to see how far your bed is from the wall. And if you've got plug sockets behind it or a lamp with a wire running down. Um, I feel that actually I just gave me an idea because I should know, but sometimes you 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 forget or you're. Uh, but but recently, actually sleeping at home in my apartment in Munich, I had almost a, I even told my partner, uh, my girlfriend, that I had almost the the feeling that electricity is running through my brain. Mm -hmm. Something's is not not um, I can't shut down, mm -hmm. and uh, I actually have to check that. Well, next time I'm over, I'll bring my email Frida. And you can pick them up off, up off Amazon for an EMF reader from 50 to 200 bucks, something like that. Um, but yeah, I go around the walls and measure it and see where I should place my bed, depending on where I am. Um, so so those two things. And another thing for traveling is eating. By the way, before we go into eating, just take it back with grounding. I, I will just summarize it. But be, instead of maybe getting a device, when you're arriving at your destination, the best thing to ground might be just to go outside, find a piece of land some some grass or go to the beach take your shoes off and spend at least 30 minutes attached to the earth yeah. or even the salt water which is a great grounding yeah, I mean, uh, substance as well so when you're grounding on the soil or on grass then you're earthing by um the word slips my mind now just by touching on a, a small area of your body when you um when you're swimming in the sea especially if it's seawater with it's high in uh, electrolytes mm -hmm. you're super grounded like it's all, all, almost the ultimate you know anti-inflammatory sure. so you need less time i guess yeah. to fully get you back to your original I'm, state i lie there floating in the water with my arms out i mean i everywhere i go I always <laughs> I always do this it's like my ultimate peaceful zone like the sun on my face lying there and i do that for 20 minutes half an hour and i do that every day when i'm near the sea And I just like the image of, of doing that and then you feel almost like electricity gets into your its, its original state mm -hmm. and uh, like you let go of all the stress of all these po positive ions that flow into the sea and you go back mm -hmm. to your natural self. Yeah, it, it reduces inflammation, it resets, or shall I say, balances your cortisol and um, it's almost impossible to be really stressed in the sea unless one, you're drowning or two, you've got a shark by your feet. Um, so it really does change everything. It's like if you, and this is the psychological element of it now, if everyone listening to this just imagines standing on the beach, on the sand, with the water just about to touch the tips of your toes. How calming is that? Just from imagining it. Mm. That's because we felt it. We felt it in the past. And now you re-enter that state. It doesn't necessarily mean you're having the anti-inflammatory state from the grounding itself, but it's the calming effect because we've anchored it to that state in the past. We haven't necessarily consciously done this before. The point is, is that's because we've been in that state before. So that's how powerful it can be. And that's how powerful placebo is as well because you just literally jumped into that state. So you can see guys that, uh, or hear that Tim's superpower is in the biohacking world considered grounding. Many people refer to you when it comes to the master of, of, of grounding, well, uh, the biohacker who uses grounding as his, his superpower. Uh, so you see now why he's super passionate about this. <laughs> yeah. So, the, but I was interrupting you actually because you were talking about eating. Well, for me, eating is an important one specific, especially And it is for everyone, obviously, because we need the energy, which we either get energy from the sun directly or we get it from our food. And obviously with food comes other things, um, the nutrients that go with it. I think of sun as a nutrient. So obviously that's a non-negotiable wherever possible. And I try to get as much sun as I can. And since adjusting my diet, removing inflammatory seed oils and most processed products, um, then, you know, I can be in the sun all day, every day. I'm not saying be in the sun all day every day for you because you know we weren't designed to be in an office with blue light all day every day and then jump out into the sun for two weeks of the year only to be burnt to a crisp i don't say that i say respect the sun my lifestyle i have built around traveling most of the year spending some time in london a few times a year but having as much sun as i can throughout the year 
follow the sun almost. But for diet, when it comes to supplementing um, my energy sources, I always make sure it's the best I can possibly get my hands on. And I don't stress if it's not the best because it's about doing the best you can most of the time. Like some people say, I can't afford organic meat or grass fed meat. It's okay, fine, don't stress about it. Just buy the best you can, best you can afford. Get rid of the products from your shopping basket and you'll be able to afford a lot better food because the majority of the costs come from the bag of crisps or the Kinder Bueno, which is my my my, my, my guilty pleasure at the moment. I enjoy one every now and then. But the point is, is that by getting rid of these products, actually your shopping becomes less and you can buy more of the good stuff. Mm. So wherever you are, focus on the best quality food you can. So for me, that means like I travel with actually these guys and I'm not an affiliate. I'm really not. I don't do any affiliate deals at all. I do share a few codes, but that's from brands that I believe in. And because of my following, I feel I can help them um, for no game. Which makes sense, yes. Um, so this is Rome Bar. Um, and it's um, basically grass-fed beef and whey protein. And then it's got apricots and hazelnuts in it. So that gives you 18.3 grams of process, uh, protein and 7.7 .7 grams of um, carbs. Now, the interesting thing is, instead of just picking up crappy snacks wherever you go all the time, and it's okay from time to time, don't get me wrong, like, it's best to set yourself up to win, not to fail. Excellent. Yeah. Now, this is a healthy snack. It's not a crappy protein bar that you see full of all the different plant proteins that make you bloat and you know chicory root fiber that bloats you or all these things for convenience you can have a quality snack while you're on your move so i carry five or six of these or generally one for each day of traveling so in that moment where i go and we're human you know sometimes it's like you know the, the on a british airways flight they bring a little packet of crackers and go here you go and a bottle of water and a sanitizing wipe it's supposed to be healthy and it's like actually it's so easy to go okay i'm hungry right now i will have that but instead, I go, no thanks, and I pull this out of my bag. So when there is that moment, I set myself up to win, not to fail. That's great, especially uh, something that is tasty and that is easy to carry and package that it doesn't mess up your your uh, stuff in your bag and uh, that gets it dirty. Mm. And I like also to, to carry a, a bag of nuts usually with me because I, I think for me they're very, very satisfying, they're high in protein, and they... They still my hunger. Yeah, I mean nuts are a good one. And for me personally, I'm working on histamine issues, which go back to my excessive antibiotic use from ten years ago. So I still have issues with some nuts uh, that give me migraines and things. So I have to work. Have no, to but that's work. great. We're gonna link to that as well. Rome, it's yeah. called. Yeah, be at the summit as well. Um, actually, um, another reason to go to the summit. I mean, as you can see, like this isn't me picking out brands to promote. It is me picking out the products that I love and use that are selected really carefully um and then i invite them to the summit and because obviously i share them in my stories and people see this a lot of people say well can you get into the summit and that's when i i work on doing that not everyone that i, I talk about is coming to the summit because it's not necessarily accessible for everyone because it's very expensive to put on an event in the center of london um and to you know you also you shared for example also our coffee before i remember that and that i really appreciate that because it's not uh, tim never does that and asks hey uh do you want me to promote the product he just shares what he likes mm -hmm. and when i see it it's an even bigger bigger compliment because there was no expectation behind it uh and as well because you mentioned the stories guys if you are listening right now to the episode and you like what you're hearing and you want to give a shout out to tim and he's very active on instagram so there's a big chance he sees your post take a screen screenshot on your phone of the episode posted tag us tim biohacker at tim biohacker at max gotzler at flowgrade and then we are looking forward to hearing from you and it's always good to to know hey there are people out there that are listening to the stuff that think it's valuable so thank you in advance well i'm going to go one further with this i just had an idea it's like so whoever does share and put it in their stories and um, also comments on the instagram post when it comes out with the best question, I'll give you two tickets to the summit with my compliments. Oh, wow, guys, so, this is something big. Um, so yeah, so that's uh, about 850 euros in value. So mm -hmm. so two tickets to one person for the best comment on this post, okay? Okay, so they have to, for example, uh, post uh, something on, on the episode, then tag us, at Tim Biohacker, at Max Gotzler. Yep, and then when we post on Instagram and I'll share this on my feed, and you put a comment, and uh, I will answer the best comment and give you two tickets. So, okay, go for it. Um, 
so just to go back to the eating thing, the other thing is, is that it's really easy to eat excessive carbs. In fact, you know, like 60% of our diets is make, made up of processed carbs. Um, and people expect to be satiated. Like for instance, when I was in Cyprus last year, it was very hard to get good food actually from where I was on the, in a, a village outside of Paphos it's very hard so I was eating I found that I ate more carbs which obviously I converted to fat very quickly because I wasn't as exercising as much as I could um, would usually sorry so for me sati being satiated with protein because it's actually that satiates you quicker so protein for me is important especially because I'm um, an ectomorph so it's very hard for me to gain weight very I mean you'll see that I'm quite thin I was actually 10 12 kilos lighter than this. What am I? Um, huge. <laughs> <laughs> Massive, but yeah, I think you're about 110 kilos, something like that. Aren't you? Uh, about um, 108, maybe. And um, yeah, and I'm 72 at the moment. I was 59.9, and you see from my post from a few weeks ago when you're watching this that, you know, the journey I went through from sick to skinny, being eating too little, thinking that fasting was the best thing out there. Because it is for people that are easy gainers that put on weight easy, but fasting for a skinny dude is not uh, the right move. Um, so anyway, so quality protein sources is fundamental for me, especially if you're generally on the thinner side and you want to keep lean and build up weight and also be satiated without eating lots of crappy products. So that's why the protein bar, uh, the, the, the meat bar by Rome is so good. The other thing is, is that I like amino acids and this is actually something um, uh, I developed with uh, ingredientologist and uh, Dr. Dom Nitschwitz, actually. Mm -hmm. He was also on the show and uh, at Flowfest, the speaker, and he's going to also be in London. Yeah, yeah, he's a very dear friend of mine. Um, I would say he's in our wolf pack. Um, but it's, so it's amino acids. So this is one that I've developed with him and uh, it's our hero product actually in our range. And I'm not doing it because I want to make money from supplements. I wanted a clean supplement that I could trust and know the sourcing of it that would give me a good quality protein. Now, amino acids, we've actually got branch chain amino acids and essential amino acids. And then we've got creatine, glutamine, and taurine and magnesium all in one stack. And it's got a little bit of beetroot, a little bit of xylitol and nothing else. And it comes from fermented sweet potatoes. So because it's fermented, the aminos are broken down already. It's almost pre-digested, I guess. So it's, you can almost feel it within five to 10 minutes. And if you have it as a pre-workout or during a workout, it, it helps boost your performance. I've actually done a very extensive post on this on Instagram, on at health optimization supplements and on mine, explaining why and the difference between the different aminos. Now, just to take it back one step, is protein is made up of different aminos. So whey protein has a certain ratio of certain aminos, which is generally better for bodybuilding because of the leucine content. Um, collagen has uh, less aminos it's around 18 and says 21 compared to whey protein and as a result that's good for skin and connective tissue and which is why it's good for the gut aminos well actually this has such a crafted breakdown of aminos it's very good for recovery and um, to support the muscles and um, is available in the muscle to help replete them during exercise within 20 minutes so it's almost immediate um But as a result, as a morning snack, waking up, having some filtered water, adding a pinch of sea salt, having three to five scoops of this, actually you're hitting the ground running. Now, the un interesting thing is, is that <clears throat> with certain aminos um, and proteins, they work at, for neurotransmitters for our brain, which helps fire up our brain and helps our brain operate properly. Mm. So when you're protein deficient, <clears throat> actually that is, can be the cause of some brain fog. So by getting your neurotransmitters firing properly and your brain comes alive. So I start the day with a glass of this with three to five scoops, depending, and the electrolytes or Celtic sea salt, because that helps with hydration and helps with brain fog. So if you've got, this is where the stack comes together and compound theory, um, clean air and breath work with a good night's sleep, with the right hydration and the right electrolytes, mental clarity and the right proteins sets you up for the day. And then, and only then, that's when you start thinking about your coffee, because otherwise you're stimulating your body with caffeine, opposed to supporting your body's natural processes. So before ramping it up, it's like having a burnt out engine in your car, but still putting your foot down in the accelerator. You're going to ruin the engine. 
what you want to do is give it the oil and the right water so your engine's running and then put your foot down on the gas which is what the caffeine is mm -hmm. so these are basic biohacks really basic and you can get aminos not necessarily so good quality not fermented source because sometimes most of the time a lot of the time they're made from bird feathers aminos they actually use bird feathers and extract it and use that instead as clean plant-based source so set yourself up I carry a tub of this everywhere, wherever I go around the world. Yeah, no, it's, uh, it, it's, it, it leads a little bit into what da Daniel Amen already said many years ago, and I actually have that in my book, The Daily Biohacker, uh, the, the breakfast that he recommends, which is a combination of uh, egg, mm -hmm. meat, and broccoli in order to get the amino acids to produce dopamine, mm -hmm. which then keeps you motivated for the day as well. Uh, so the amino acids are also a yeah, precursor, obviously, for pr the production then of dopamine and then... Yep. Uh, substances that keep you motivated um so so that's that's you know the really the fundamentals of these things and i do carry various other supplements for instance i have b12 methylfolate and trimethylglycine in one pill um and that's um called methyl guard plus that's because i have a genetic um component to optimize methylation uh, which helps me detoxify and produce energy and red blood cell pro you know production and cell uh, cellular health so i carry those and various other supplements i carry anoracetam or paracetam with me which is a smart drug um, which again plays on the way that the brain uses choline um, to help the brain fire um, there's various things like that that i use i carry around actually um, this is my favorite magnesium um, it's by upgraded formulas now it's nanoparticle magnesium and why that's different is so if you imagine the size of a cell in you know um, is this big for instance magnesium particles are this big so getting it into the cell isn't that easy and that's why magnesium from foods the right foods if the foods are actually not deficient in magnesium is the best way of doing it but what upgraded formulas have done is they've actually made nanoparticle magnesium so if the cell is this big the nanoparticle is this big which means that you actually can refill the cells deficiency of magnesium much easier because the, the particle is smaller. Mm -hmm. I found since having this, and this is a big claim I know, but I would usually have magnesium IV two to three times a week. I was taught to do it. Um, and since having this magnesium, I don't need magnesium IV anymore. And actually I had my blood work back yesterday from bionic um who are also an exhibitor at the summit who do blood testing before to look at what deficiencies you have to supplement correctly um it showed that my magnesium levels were perfect and, and that is since having this supplement so for me non-negotiable in the morning and before bed now for some people magnesium before bed stimulates them because it upregulates around 400 different processes um but for some people it calms them and helps them sleep better so it's also a sleep hack Mm. There's some great studies uh, that show that magnesium actually is a, a sleep-inducing agent. I think uh, the study was done with citrate. I don't know what does that have. Uh? So this is um, magnesium chloride. Okay, yeah, but I think that yes, different formula. Yeah, magnesium also one of the ones. By the way, I just had an interview with uh, Dr. Elmar Wienicke, who worked with the German national soccer team. Mm. And he is called the, the Pope of uh, Micronutrients in Germany. Mm -hmm. And uh, he also recommended magnesium as one of the essentials, accord, uh, along with vitamin D, uh, with uh, B vitamins, he, uh, he also mentioned. Mm -hmm. But there are several others. And this episode is actually also up on the flow bridge of all the German speakers who want to uh, learn more about the micronutrients and, and their, what Tim just mentioned in German language. You can listen to the episode with Dr. Wienicke. All right. So, I mean, the final one that I carry with me, and bearing in mind for me, digestion was a big thing because of the amount of antibiotics I had and liver stress and, um, and whatnot is an ancient one. And this is called liver bitters, Swedish bitters specifically. Uh, I thought it was an aroma, uh, no, aroma or something. I mean, I do, carry, I do carry some essential oils and actually um, bergamot is one of them and um, neroli is another. And instead of using aftershaves and things which are actually really high in chemicals and pollutants, I use the natural ones. But this is actually um, liver bitters from Swedish bitters. Now what bitters do is actually they're so bitter, what it does is it, we have a taste for a reason. If something's bad for us, we go, oh, we don't want to eat it. Modern food companies put flavorings on it, almost put, you know, sprinkle flavoring over a, 
a poo so that it tastes good to us so we want to eat more of this crap whereas if they did it without the in flavor enhancements we wouldn't want to eat it because our senses tell us it's not good for us okay now what liver bitters do is when it lands on the tongue it actually triggers it, it, it stimulates the liver by tr triggering it saying you need to start digesting something what it does is it upregulates the liver naturally which promotes better digestion okay so i use six drops of this before every meal okay um, well. it's absolutely magical formula and it's many swedish bitters is fine it's not a particular brand i promote specifically this one i like is a german brand i can't even read the bottles because i keep on re refilling it um bitter bitter segen bitter segen it's like a bitter blessing okay um that's a good name <laughs> um so so yeah so i have this before every meal five minutes before every meal and actually um my friend and uh health optimization summit speaker Chris Gethin introduced me to a guy recently that is writing a very exhaustive book on um, bitters and how he reversed certain nasty um, health issue um, with it and, and going into all the science and all the studies behind it. And actually that's what spurred me to start researching and looking into it more and testing it. And in fact, I mean, I use digestive enzymes, one that I brought out recently um which are great and you know i don't bloat with certain foods when i take them um and things and i often take ox bile if i have a very fatty meal to support my liver but since using these liver bitters i don't need any digestive support so it's pretty much a, a portable liver support yeah. system yeah. that you use mm -hmm. okay wow also for, uh, easy to travel with because you can take it actually in your hand luggage it's mm -hmm. small enough yeah. for the ones who don't see it right now it's like a little it looks like an essential oil bottle actually but it's uh, something that you just drop five drops of it five to ten you said uh, before a meal yeah exactly okay. and that just indicates because if you think about the food for a second it should when we cook and pre prepare our food those smells and the tastes prepare our liver for the right enzymes um, and our digestive, actually our full digestive process to prepare to be primed for the food we're just about to eat. And we can get... So that's what I always say. When you prepare your food, when you start cooking, when you pre uh, take the, the, the food into your hands, your digestive process already starts yeah. and you see that actually that the body reacts when you cut an onion and your eyes w start watering uh, that's uh, the, the body actually works with that and that's when you're you're so surprised when you're sitting on the couch watching net netflix and all of a sudden the doorbell rings and and someone brings you sushi your body is even though it's great food you know but it's it's kind of like a shock mm -hmm. like what i'm getting there i was not prepared yeah. uh, and your digestion won't work as well as a result so what this does is this prepares the liver Which is why, like, actually people, actually there's a Dr. Mark Hyman quote I nearly shared out today on Instagram, but didn't yet, was people that cook their own food at home have significantly, and I can't remember the exact percentage now, significantly lower rate of diabetes and chronic health issues because they prepare their own food. And one, obviously, it's not isolated, so they're preparing their own food, so they've got their own ingredients. The ingredients are probably going to be better than, you know, crappy packet food. But also they're preparing themselves to eat the food that they're going to eat. And their digestive process is ready for that. Liver bitters, bitters help prepare your digestive process. And I've noticed a significant shift since using these. And I've been using them probably about eight or nine months now. And I was told years ago to do it. But sometimes you can only stumble across or refine these things when you're ready to do so. Such as some of the things that we talked about today, you're going to go, oh, it makes sense. Sounds good. I like that. I could do it. And then you'll forget about it. And then six months time, you might stumble across it. And you go, actually, yeah, that makes sense. What I watched all those months ago now. And you're incorporating. You'll go, why didn't I do it before? But the point is you found it. You've been primed to it now. Test it out when it's right for you. That's great. And I, I hear uh, a lot of people dealing with their liver and uh, going to doctors that I recommend in Germany, for example. And then uh, a couple of people, actually a good friend of mine recently reached out and said, my liver parameters don't look good. What can I do? And uh, this is great recommendation also for people who have liver issues to activate the liver get them going mm -hmm. uh, it's a natural thing you can easily do and and you have to eat anyway so you might as well try that before for sure yeah, for sure i mean people with eczema um that have got uh, acne hormonal imbalances um females coming off of the contraceptive pill um all sorts of different ailments that come back 
to the liver needing to detoxify and needing supporting um, for de detoxification or rebalancing the hormones it's great for that it's really amazing how the body the environment it involved in is how we're geared to be and yet we haven't caught up yet with all this modern technology and all this stuff and we're just like i said at the beginning of the podcast using technology to min mimic nature in an unnatural world that's everything that we talk about living more naturally in an unnatural world i think that's what it always comes back to wow yeah tim there's already a lot we have the bitters now i see a couple more things on there do we still want to cover them before i ask you a couple more personal questions and we round up the interview um well one is just paracetam um, which is my smart drug of choice ah okay so uh, we don't really need to drill into that uh, too much. i think that uh, that smart drug uh, topic we could uh, cover a whole episode but i mean essentially just to very quickly is that most of the smart drugs or nootropics actually um are enhanced or en enhance acetylcholine uh in the brain this is a commonality across all of the smart drugs pretty much what um Paracetam, aniracetam, oxyracetam, all the different variants of pretty much do is open up the receptors in the brain so that you can use acetylcholine better. So if your diet is rubbish, you're not having enough choline, for instance, you're not having enough eggs, using a smart drug will have marginal gains. So it's basically your body saying, I need to be supported better before I can use these things. You can't use the smart drug to overclock the body for long. It might work on a one-day basis. And for some people having aniracetam and things who actually get headaches from using it because they haven't got enough choline and the brain's going, I need more choline, so you get a headache. Mm. So paracetam is great as long as your nutrition is down. So that's, that's paracetam. That's the one that I prefer out of all of them. You can try all these different smart drugs and mushrooms and things like that, which I, you know, I'm a fan of selectively, but really paracetam or aniracetam is a good one. And the final thing here, I would also, I would say, focus on the basics first and before you use smart drugs. For me, actually, smart drugs helped uh, at some point when I was writing the book and I really was uh, b before my deadline and I needed a couple of really productive days. Uh, but my experience is that the body is just a great accountant and the productivity that you kind of mm -hmm. take for now, uh, you kind of have to get it back later when you when you when you look for the for the other side when you balance yourself out again yeah yeah i completely agree borrowed borrowed energy borrowed um energy. and this is actually a term that oli sovieri um once taught me uh he's like you borrow energy it's like you have a peak you borrow that energy and then you have a crash and it's the same with cocaine users they feel great at the time and then they have a crash afterwards it's always borrowed energy yeah. and that's why you should support your body to operate as it should do not overclock it um, and I think a lot of biohackers think that they can overclock the body and do that for too long and then they burn out. So I mean, you, can, you can maybe raise your baseline a little bit, especially when you come from a place when you were sick for a long time and you think your baseline is low. But uh, I totally agree. And especially with uh, these extreme um, ideas, I'm thinking about the movie Limitless right now, which I mentioned several times in my book, because this drug uh, that is presented there is like presented like the ultimate limitless flow drug that gets you into a state where you're hyperproductive, where you write books, where you clean up your room, where, mm -hmm. where, you, uh, where he's uh, seducing a girl at the same time. Like it's, it's, it's a nice idea mm -hmm. and it might work at some point, but to extend that over a longer period of time is uh, just, it, it's machine thinking. It's not mm -hmm. thinking in biological uh, rhythms. So homeostasis is what it comes back down to. Yes. And I think, I think, to to round off about your point of um the baseline is when i before i got sick i didn't realize i was operating at operating at probably 70 to 75 percent and then i got sick and i operated at 50 percent and i didn't realize it was 50 percent of at that point and then when i started improving and getting better and better and better and better and better and i realized actually my 95 percent i'm at 95 percent now i didn't realize how inefficient i was before i was sick i wasn't giving my body the things i needed and then you fill this 95% and you say, oh my God, I'm so much better than when I was well. <laughs> mm. And you have a new baseline. And then I'm always optimizing for the last 5%. And, and that's where it comes to. Some people say, well, why can't you just relax and stop biohacking now? It's like, but the thing is, it's not about reversing sickness and always reversing sickness. Oh, something's come up, let's fix it. It is, I want to maintain and I want to prevent sickness. I want to 
operate at my best and not wait until something goes wrong. It's like your car. You get it serviced every year or every two years. Whenever it tells you it needs a service to stop something, stop it breaking down on you. But in, with our bodies, we wait until it breaks down. And that's what traditional medicine typically does. You haven't looked after your car, it goes wrong. I'm making sure that my car is constantly serviced based on what it says it needs. So the final thing is actually this roll of tape. Mm. So the, uh, he has a roll of tape in his hands right now. Surgical tape. I'm not going to put it on now and look like a dummy. Is it mouth taping? Yes, it is. <laughs> so actually, I, I rarely need it now. Um, but I find that... So most of us end up becoming mouth breathers, as we know. And it's very commonly known in this space now that you should nose breathe. One, because it produces more nitric oxide, um, which is obviously a vasodilator, which is better for circulation. It's better for brain um, uh, clarity, mental clarity, and all sorts of things, like a whole host of um, things. It also, you also have a microbiome in your nose, which you don't necessarily have the same filtering when you breathe through your, your mouth. Um, and it generally, mouth breathing should be in an emergency. It should be for kissing or for eating not for the general day to day. But the problem is we're so untrained these days and we're so used to breathing through our mouths that in fact we don't use our nose so much. Now, as you'll see on my before, during and after post on Instagram, you'll see that while I don't have a, an amazingly defined jaw, it's significantly better than it was. Because if you're not nose breathing, actually it changes the shape of your face. You'll often see people that have been mouth breathing too long that their jaw is actually set back further back mm -hmm. like this and they have a smaller chin so and that's all about jaw and mouth development and things like this it's actually uh, the the book that i can re recommend is breathe by james nestor who go goes into that a lot and mm -hmm. even makes breathing the number one culprit mm -hmm. for dental health mm -hmm. yes. and yes. not not diet but mm -hmm. but breathing techniques yeah and i i would i would mainly agree with that um i For instance, people that wake up with dry mouth or snoring, all of these things are linked to mouth breathing, um, nearly always with, with snoring. So from time to time, I mouth tape to make sure that I am nose breathing, not mouth, uh, mouth breathing during the night. Um, and depending on the oxygenation in the room, you know, you feel significantly better for it. So I just carry that just in case. And also, you know, if... Uh, Yeah, it's a wonderful technique. I actually used to uh, do it a lot, and sometimes you you wake up and it's still the the tape's still on. Sometimes it, you lose it overnight, mm. and then you feel so uh, refreshed also through your nose, like your nose. You feel it that it's a bit dry because you breathe uh, through it the whole the whole night. But then I had m moments and uh, mo mornings where I felt super recovered after that, and I think it was definitely the effect also of the nitric oxide release. And also because it's about three times harder to breathe through the nose, mm -hmm. but you push the air more into the belly mm -hmm. where there's more blood so you can actually get more oxygen for the amount of air. Mm -hmm. So when you breathe uh, into the chest, there's a lot of volume that comes in, but there's actually not that much oxygen mm -hmm. getting into your bloodstream. Well, I agree. And to add to that, actually, and this is based on Patrick McGowan's work from Beauty Co. Clinic. The Oxygen Advantage. Yes. What an amazing book. I love this thing. The, the interesting thing here is it's almost like a tug of war or a contradiction. So if you breathe through your nose, you generally breathe less breaths per minute. We should breathe eight to 11 breaths a minute, something like that. When we're mouth breathing, you'll see, and you can measure this on an aura ring. Again, you know, biohack 101. And you can track your respiratory rate, sleep, readiness, you know, deep sleep, REM sleep, light sleep, body temperature heart rate variability all this stuff so mm -hmm. the aura ring which i'm sure you probably talked about many times but the point is it tells you a respiratory rate some people have 16 to 18 breaths per minute that's often when they're mouth breathing if you breathe through your nose you breathe slower and deeper and so you can get your breath down to 12 11 breaths per minute now why is that important well the interesting thing is the more we breathe the less oxygenated we are generally because the better we can deal with carbon dioxide i.e the longer we can hold the out our, our breath on the out breath the better we can deal with carbon dioxide why is this important because carbon dioxide helps force oxygen into the cell so the better we deal with carbon dioxide the better we are oxygenated so if you can't hold your breath very well 
you're not oxygenated very well. Mm -hmm. So by using mouth tape, we're forced to breathe through our nose, we breathe slower, and we're more, we're better oxygenated, as well as the nitric oxide production and various other benefits that go with it. By the way, with, with breathing, Tim, I have something, and you're gonna love that. I, I listened to that recently on the Andrew Huberman mm -hmm. podcast. Mm. And he shared a scientific study that uh, observed breathing while reading. Mm -hmm. And there's a difference when you read on paper, they noticed that every five minutes mm -hmm. you do something like that. And we do that actually in the night, uh, during the night, during the day, n uh, normally when we're not uh, interacting, we mean just n living pretty much or existing. Mm -hmm. So we do that every five minutes, every, we, we do something like that. <sighs> But uh, when we read something on a device mm -hmm. with blue light, then we don't do that, mm -hmm. it's suppressed. So uh, we actually get less oxygen and they did tests with people reading the same text on in a book or on paper versus on a device and they noticed that the recollection also the memory mm -hmm. the memorization mm -hmm. of the text on paper was much higher than on the device i thought that was super interesting really interesting i would love to see what it's like on a kindle but uh, i'd love to see that yeah it's actually interesting because i love andrew's work actually um, wonderful podcast for every uh, one who wants to dig into anything pretty much uh, on a scientific level and mm. find out about the current e evidence and s uh, scientific studies mm. he's a professor at stanford university on neuroscience and uh, I, i feel like it's almost like he's recording his lectures to his students and does a podcast out of it and it's yeah. it's just awesome he's amazing he's amazing i spoke to him a couple of weeks ago to try to get into the conference this year but um he's so busy with the research work going on and the podcast and things so maybe another year but um yeah actually there's a, a post of his from instagram i shared out last week uh, so this will be in a few weeks time i guess for the guys listening um of where n nasal breathing shows how it stimulates the brain and how the brain moves with each breath It's actually really awesome. You should have a look. Uh, it's just basically looks like an X-ray um, of a brain um, a GIF, and uh, yeah, showing how it, it stimulates the brain from nose breathing, and whereas not when mouth breathing. It's really interesting. Really interesting. Tim, we've covered so many topics already. <laughs> I think for now, for today, we've given our audience enough because I want to before they shut off. Again, talk a little bit about the summit. Mm -hmm. I have a couple more questions, but let's f uh, first talk about the summit. Uh, again, during the episode, you came up with the idea of giving away two tickets. Mm -hmm. And to the person that is commenting underneath the post of the podcast, uh, you can also share a screenshot, tag us. Uh, that way you'll also get into the raffle, I would say. Follow at Tim Biohacker, at Flowgrade, or at Max Gotzler and comment underneath and the best comment underneath the post or on a story um, will be selected and will win two tickets for the summit and the summit takes place and I'll let you say again when and where 28th and 29th of May in central London and for the ones who want to secure their tickets beforehand you can do that on our partner link on flowgrade.de slash HOS. It will lead you to the website and uh, show you where you can get a good deal on your tickets for the summit. I I'll be there, I'll be speaking, and I hope to see you there. And before we shut off, Tim, a couple more personal questions. One is you are very active on Instagram and you post a lot of things, but are there accounts that you follow and get inspiration from? And you can mention up to three. I love Andrew Huberman's uh, account. His podcast is amazing. His Instagram is a distilled version of that. Very, very, very big fan of that. Um, Levite, uh, L-I-V-E-V-I-T-A-E. -E, that's Ryan Carter, who's a, our mutual friend, Ryan Carter. It's our mutual friend. Um, very similar mindset to me. He's more of a nutritional scientist, so he speaks about, more about the mitochondria rather than me, energy production. Um, because I like it to be more accessible slightly. Mm, and mm, I think that's really it in terms of, you know, my favorite accounts right now, those two. There's there's a whole host of accounts I keep an eye on, but a lot of it's regurgitated, it's other people's stuff and things like that. I really like getting a lot of my resources from books or podcasts and, and then studying a topic and then sharing about it. 
um, all my own experiences. So, so yeah, I mean, a plethora of other people's accounts for inspiration and podcasts, but yeah, really those, those two accounts are the main ones. All right. Who is someone that you would like to have speaking at one of the future health optimization summits that would be like a dream come true for you? I think in the health space, Andrew Huberman, without a doubt. I mean, in fact, I tried uh, for this year. It's just not possible. Uh, Tim Ferriss, because he is really, in my mind, the original biohacker, really. I mean, since his mindset is deconstructing, originally was deconstructing everything um, and optimizing. And I think that's really the mindset. Uh, so Tim, Tim Ferriss would be amazing. Uh, I know it's not something he would probably ever do now because uh, he's evolved past this. Um, so yeah, Andrew Huberman or Tim Ferriss would be the two, you know, ultimates. Everyone else, I think, you know, I've been in contact with and discussed this year or future years anyway. Uh, yeah. Um, and by the way, while, while we're at the in the future, where do you see yourself in 15 years from now? Um <clears throat> A posh cabin near some woods with a field. Hopefully found my partner in crime and a couple of kids living mm, not ancestral too much. Um, I mean, Ben, as we were discussing earlier on, Ben does this very well with his family. Um, I think it's a little bit too ancestral for me, a bit too disconnected. But um, something, something like that. And I think in terms of career, just uh, practice, continuing to practice what I preach. And, and having little mini versions of me or my partner, um, <laughs> you know, understanding this stuff from, from the get go, opposed to having to figure it out, you know, which is what our parents haven't done and we are. And so I think passing that on to our kids would be awesome. So that's really where I see myself in the next 15 years. And bearing in mind in 15 years, I'll be 58. <laughs> It's still probably looking younger than now. <laughs> <laughs> when, when you look at the trend, yeah. my little Benjamin Button here. <laughs> and But it's it's wonderful that, that you share that, Tim, because I think that many people perceive you business-oriented, tough guy, you know, running a big summit, having employees, a business, um, knowing a lot of uh, information about health and everything. But I think that uh, what... But maybe you you show it to your friends is your sensitive side a bit more, which is really uh, that you yeah you you also have dreams and wishes and in, in, in personal areas like family and and uh, where you live and how you live and with whom you live and uh, we spend a lot of time talking, be it in the sauna, be it on the couch about life and about uh, the philosophy and we could record actually on that as well. Mm. Um, because what I would like the listeners and the viewers to know is, uh, yeah, that there's much more to what the eye, what meets the eye usually. And when it, when it comes to Tim Gray, uh, there is a whole lot of uh, emotion behind you that I got to see. And I'd like to know, because I think that's something uh, that makes you more colorful in a way, more... Um, Yeah, your charisma then shines through um, when, when you get on to these topics where where it comes out that, yeah, there's someone who, who wishes for not only more health, but also just uh, happiness for good company, for very basic things. And then that's uh, what I wanted to part. Okay, last question, Tim. What is something that you believe in, but you cannot prove? Wow. Um, I have absolutely no idea. Um, I usually look to prove the things that I can't prove. Grounding, again, was a big one for me. People were saying it's woo-woo and BS. There's now 23 studies, including peer-reviewed ones at that. So, I mean, that was really the thing that was unproven for me. Um, I'd like to try and, not that I'm a conspiracy guy, but I'd like to try and prove that Will Smith and the slap was, <laughs> was planned. Um, We talked about that. I'd love to. I'd love, that would be difficult. <laughs> <laughs> I'd, love, I'd love to prove that. Um, but uh, no, all jokes aside, I think uh, grounding is the one I think that everyone should be benefiting from. And if it was 
more widely spoken about, then uh, that's it. But I think it's proven, and yet people don't seem to believe the studies, even though they're peer-reviewed. We only want to believe what we want to believe. So, yeah. Wow. All right. Guys, I think we had enough for today. Uh, in the outro, I will mention again all the links that are important to you right now. Um, Tim, thank you for being on the show. It was a wonderful conversation. I think the listeners had an impression of even how it is when we, we sit next to each other without the microphone or the camera on and uh, what stuff we talk about. So I think it was really, really nice to show them how, how it is between biohackers. Thank you for being on the show. Thank you for having me, mate. Go for flow. <laughs>